Hi, I'm Howie Rose, and I think you know the individual <laughs> sitting across from me. This is the guy who used to wear number five for the New York Mets, David Wright. But uh, it will be emblazoned in the heart, I think, of every Mets fan from now on, including the man award himself, David. And, and since you've had a little bit of time to remove yourself from the immediacy of that last game, has it found its place, and what funnels through your head? Well, I have five somewhere. I mean, if you want me to get <laughs> it's under here somewhere. So, uh, you know, it's just what a special night. I think it's probably a little too soon to really start reflecting, but, you know, I've been getting videos all morning and text messages and pictures, and scrolling through them, it's just, it hits you all over again. Like, wow, what a over-the-top, generous thing for the Mets to do, and what an over-the-top, supportive thing for the fans to come out and do. It was um, one of a kind and something that um, I'll never forget and something that I've never uh, ever seen before. I mean, that was truly a first for me. The love and support from the fans uh, meant the world to me. You know, your buddy Michael Kadir summed it up perfectly. Mm -hmm. He said, it's kind of like a wedding <laughs> where you're not really going to remember it, but right. you'll have the pictures and you'll have the videos. But that notwithstanding, was there a moment, one little nanosecond even, that you embrace more than any other? <sighs> I mean, I would say the the curtain calls, the chanting, the signs. I, I pulled in yesterday around 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and there were dozens of right jerseys and number fives waiting for me in the players' parking lot. So just from then on, it became apparent to me that this was going to be a special day. Um, and then you go, you know, selfishly with with my daughter throwing the first pitch and having my family on the field and them getting here to be able to see me play uh, meant a lot to me so I would say a, a combination of just the 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 over-the-top support from the organization the fans my family my friends um, really tugged at the heartstrings uh, uh, yesterday and you're going into what we could called civilian life, I guess. <laughs> it's a much different feeling for someone who's always had spring training and mm. off-season workouts and all of those things. What do you envision this next few months or year or two years of your life to be like? I've said it before, I, I love this game. I really do. And um, I'd like to be involved somehow. Um, you know, it's something where um, I've been a Met for half my life now. And um, that's a, a badge of honor for me and something that I take a lot of pride in. So uh, I guess to answer your question, I'm not really sure what to do with myself, at least over the, the next couple of months. But um, it'll give me some time to sit down with Molly and, uh, you know, kind of talk about what's going to happen, what's not going to happen, and kind of go from there. But I'm, you know, obviously looking forward for the off season to spend some time with the girls and, uh, maybe teach Olivia how to throw a little bit better because <laughs> she was kind of like her dad. It was on target, but in the dirt. So uh, She went over the top, though. She did go over the top, and, yeah, she had pretty good form. We just got to build that arm strength up, so maybe her and I can do some of those shoulder rehab exercises <laughs> together and get right back on it. You know, you mentioned your wife, Molly, and I can't help but think that Olivia was born right around the time that you had to stop playing back in 2016, if I'm not mistaken. So... When I think of what Molly's been through since then, dealing with what a wife has to go through when her husband's life has been complicated mm -hmm. the way yours was, what's her life been like <laughs> and, and how have you managed to perhaps grow in that relationship because of what's gone down with you physically? You know, I can remember being in L.A. because Dr. Watkins performed my neck surgery. Molly was, we, we were due, I think, in a couple weeks and I was set to have surgery, and I couldn't fly for, mm -hmm. I think, 10 days or 14 days after surgery. And, you know, I remember asking the doctor, you know, like, am I going to be able to, you know, hold my daughter, you know, when she's born? And he says, as long as she's not bigger than 10 pounds. So, uh, you know, that was kind of my, my limit. But, yeah, I mean, it was certainly challenging, you know, uh, selfishly for me, but probably more so uh, for her. I guess if there's a silver lining um, to be found in all of these injuries and surgeries was I got a chance to be around the girls more, got a chance to be around Olivia when typically I'd be traveling a lot, you know, and obviously I would have loved to have played, um, you know, but if you're, you're looking for a silver lining in things, I think that that's a, a pretty big one. What kind of input is she going to have, meaning Molly, about the next step for you professionally? 
she's gonna have some say. I mean, it's when you're a baseball player, and especially when you're a baseball player with a family. Uh, you're, so, I mean, it's 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 selfishness. I'm certainly not complaining because baseball has given me more than I could have ever dreamt of. But you know, with the the travel schedule and you know spring training and um, being away for for half the summer and uh, you know trying to train the off season or in my case rehab in the off season to get back, it's it's. It's a lot of time, so it takes somebody that's uh, you know willing to put up with a lot of it. And for me, I'm you know I'd consider myself pretty crazy as far as bringing baseball home with me. Mm -hmm. So you know it's not hard to tell if I am playing well or the team's playing well or if I'm struggling when I come home. And it's been a calming influence for me, especially with the girls. Beyond your immediate family of your wife and children are your parents. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you ever met. Adam Graves, who used to play for the New York Rangers. Uh, Never met him, but I, I know of him. If there is a person in all of sports that I've come across in all my years that I could compare to you, it would be Adam. Very, very similar mm -hmm. in the way you comport yourself, the charitable work and all that. Interestingly, both of your fathers were in law enforcement. Mm -hmm. What is the connection between having a father in law enforcement and becoming the kind of person you are? I mean, I think it's the direct connection, if that makes any sense. Um, discipline was big in, in our household with me and my three brothers. Being punctual, making good grades, um, staying out of trouble. We grew up, and, and, and my dad was kind of going up through the ranks at the time. Um, and my mother also was in the school system, so you know we get a lot of our discipline and um, that foundation from my mom as well. But um, you know, going through canine and vice and narcotics and you know doing those things my dad probably saw some things that he certainly didn't want to happen to us and you know he made it known that these are the rules you're gonna abide by the rules or there's gonna be some pretty severe consequences to pay and uh, you know it was um, at the time you're know, like you know he's, he's too tough you know why is he so tough on us you know me and my brothers complaining but you know fast forward a few years and I couldn't be more thankful for that type of upbringing because you know, it, 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 it provides that kind of foundation for, you know, forget baseball, but for life. And I think those types of characteristics kind of pour over into baseball where, um, I mean, he was never afraid to take baseball away from me if I didn't make the grades or it wasn't necessarily making the grades, it was putting the effort to make the grades. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I remember him always asking me, you know, is a, is a B the best that you could possibly do? And that obviously, it's a trick question. You know, like <laughs> if I say yes, then there's always something more you can do. You know, and I, I, I tried I to, used to say yes. Yeah, I tried to treat. I tried to treat it like that in baseball too. You know, is is that the best I could do? Is there something else I could be doing to make myself better? And and that kind of you know, there's a correlation between those types of life lessons and baseball. Reminisce just for a minute or yeah. two. I I know how much that home run in the World Series meant to you mm -hmm. against Kansas City. And Eddie Cranepool hit his World Series home run in 1969. Mm -hmm. And you could look at this on YouTube if you want. The entire time around the bases, Eddie had a big smile on his face. Now, he was an original Met. It was just a cameo that first mm -hmm. year. But, you know, he went through some tough times. And I asked him once, what were you thinking about? What thoughts were fleeting through your mind as you circled the bases with a World Series home run? And he, he said, I was thinking about the process, all the losing early on, mm -hmm. and all the people. Casey Stengel came into his head, who was an immediate influence on him. When you hit your home run in the World Series in 2015, you had a big smile, too. Mm -hmm. Did any images come dashing in and out of your mind as you circled the bases? High fly ball to left. Back at the wall, and the captain's gone deep, two to one. After I stepped on each base, Running the bases, I would take a quick glance into the stands and just to see the, the joy and the passion, especially what we as Mets and Mets fans and National League Baseball in New York had been through since 2006. Um, it was kind of a culmination of, for me, in that quick round trip was, you know, obviously joy and satisfaction for what, for me, going through that rehab process to, to get to that point. Um, you know, kind of that flood of different thoughts while circling the bases and trying to glance up at the fans and seeing the packed house going nuts. I don't remember much about it, but I remember feeling a sense of joy, not just for us, for, for, for the runs, but joy for 
the fans because there's such a connection, I think, between myself and the fan base. Having been through, you know, the few highs early in my career and then the lows and then back up to, to get a chance to play in the World Series was an unbelievable feeling and, you know, it, it, it felt like you were just floating around the bases. So that's around the top of the list, I'm sure. And the top of the list, yeah. Well, and we've sure. talked about some of the others, which yeah. fans who paid attention would remember the home run in Philadelphia mm, that when was you came back. Very the, cool, the yep. hit over Johnny Damon's head mm -hmm. off of Mariano when the Mets were establishing that mm -hmm. they were a force in 2006. Are there any favorite moments you have? Maybe they just mean more to you than a fan would even remember, but something that you cherish, one at bat, one play, one experience on the field that we might not think of at first glance. I would say um, the walk-off home run against Heath Bell. As Wright hits one deep to left field. It's out of here! David Wright with a two-out, two-run walk-off home run in the bottom of the ninth. Was big for me because it was a big game for us where we were going back and forth and we were having some bullpen issues at the time and I think we coughed up a lead late and um, it was kind of one of those where it was like oh here we go again and um, you know I remember it was a, a first pitch slider um, somebody was on first base we we're tied I think and um, first pitch slider for a ball then another pitch slider it was a good pitch and he had done the exact same thing to me the night before so I was looking slider and hooked it down the line and you know to, to go up there with a game plan and you know sometimes the game plan works sometimes it doesn't but you know after the first pitch slider to look for another one because he threw me the night before and to be able to deliver right there and kind of you know try to change the mindset that it's not a here we go again it's you know let's get something rolling and try to finish this year out strong I thought was for me um, you know, something when I look back on saying that that was a, a big at bat for for me and, and my career moving forward. That was your first walk off? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. When did you know you had arrived as a big <laughs> leaguer? Did that do it? No, that's... That? Uh, when I say arrived, arrived, I mean as a, as a big-time player, uh, not just a guy who's going to earn his paycheck. I would here. say after my second year in the big leagues. I made my... After my rookie year, anybody can do it for two months or two and a half months, you know? And then they say, you're going to hit this sophomore slump. And the whole offseason, that was kind of my mindset. And the driving force was that I'm not going to be the sophomore slump guy. So I put in the work and then, you know, had a good year, uh, my second year. And then it was, okay, uh, I know I belong. Um, you know, I know I can be a, a guy that can be counted on in the middle of the lineup to produce. Um, now it's let's try to refine some things and let's be as good of an all-around player as you can possibly be. I want to steal bases. I want to play gold glove caliber defense. Um, I want to hit for average, I want to hit for power. Um, you know, so that was kind of the mindset where, okay, I've survived and to an extent excelled for a year and a half in the big leagues. Now let's really take that next step. And, and uh, you know, fortunately with the guys I had around me and, you know, that 2006 team was, uh, you know, offensively it was a lot of fun to be a part of. I mean, you're talking about Jose Reyes at the top of the lineup, Paul Duca hitting 300 in the two hole, you know, then you got, you know, me and Beltran, Delgado, um, Jose Valentin had a great year, um, Sean Green. I mean, that was just an, an offense there. We could beat you with speed. We could beat you with power. We could beat you playing small ball. We could beat you playing three-run home run baseball. I mean, it was just a, a team where um, you don't know how good you have it until you don't have those types of guys around um, to either pick up the load or give you those cheap RBIs or let you score 100 runs, things like that. So that was a that was a fun team to be a part of. And Willie Randolph said something to you <clears throat> in St. Louis mm -hmm. the year before. Walking back the to the, the ballpark, season, yeah. On the way back. Do you remember what that was and how that might have set up 06 and maybe even your career? It was 2005, and, um, you know, we had just, I, I think, lost a, a tough one in St. Louis, and the ballpark's right next to our hotel. So we're walking back to the hotel, and we just kind of happened to, come out at the same time and, and start walking back together and he put his arm around me and he said uh, you know this is it's not this isn't this is not gonna be like this you know this is a bump in the road for us but we are trending up and um, you know you're gonna be a big reason why we keep trending up and to have a I guess a very experienced baseball man but a young manager have that much faith in a young player who's got two years in the big leagues at that point uh, meant the world to me and, and even I got more 
fired up going into that offseason to try to be that guy that Willie Randolph wants me to be. And that's um, was such a motivating force for me to uh, continue to try to improve. And you know that was that, that was really big for me. So can you be Willie Randolph to someone years down the road? Is that on the table, managing yeah, a big league no. club, or is that not yeah, in your future? I don't think so. I don't think, uh, future. I don't think that's. Uh, I don't think that's for me. It's. Uh, um, I love being around the game. I love talking the game. I love. Um, you know, one of the biggest things for me going through this whole rehab process was I spent a lot of time in Florida and in the minor leagues and getting a chance to sit down and talk baseball with a different type of generation of players um, was really cool for me because, you know, you had guys that, you know, at first are a bit standoffish because I, I don't know if they just think that I'm mean or... <laughs> you know, not willing to share some of this stuff. But once we got to know each other and they started asking me questions, I really enjoyed sitting down and just talking baseball with them. Or, you know, there were a couple of infielders in A-ball that, you know, would come up and ask me questions during early work and I'd sit there and work with them at third or short or wherever they were playing. Um, and I really enjoyed that. So I think I'd like to be around at some point. Um, I'm not sure what type of role it is, but, I, you know, I love being around the game. I love talking the game. I love working with some of the younger players. So I think that that is something just off the top of my head that interests me. Well, your legacy here speaks for itself. And we joked about the number five a little mm -hmm. while ago, but someday I'm sure that's going to be hanging up from the roof here. What would that mean to you to <laughs> have your number retired? Well, I got to start being a lot nicer to Jay Horwitz, I think, you know, because he's, he's uh, heading this up and I think he gets the call. So I uh, got to start showering with gifts and love. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's tough for me to even think about that because when you look up there and, you know, I was very fortunate to be a part of the, the Piazza ceremony, you know, and, and he's certainly on a different level with, uh, you know, everything he's accomplished on this game. But to just see, you know, the connection that he has with the fans and the impact that he had on this city and this franchise, to even be considered anywhere near that type of, uh, of level and that type of player um, is an honor in itself. So with or without... Um, the jersey thing, um, it's just, uh, it really is a tremendous honor just to be in that same um, breadth of a sentence, I guess, if that makes any sense. Mike Piazza's number is up there, <laughs> so is Tom Seaver's. Mm -hmm. And if Tom Seaver is the franchise, you are the heartbeat. Oh, well. And on behalf of everyone connected with the New York Mets, we appreciate you and everything you've done. And I am sure we'll be seeing a lot more of you ahead. Well, I can't thank you enough. That's uh, obviously uh, over the top two for the compliment. So thank you for everything. And that's basically the best way we can sum up saying so long to David for now. <laughs> thank you for everything. Thank you.